Welcome to the One Within All to another episode of Interverse Podcast. I'm your host, Chance, and today I am sure we're going to be diving into some ancient mysteries, some deep philosophical questions about who we are, where we came from, why we're here, and what does it mean going forward for us to be investigating these things and finding very different answers than what we've been provided by our teachers, by our society, by our so-called history. And I'm very excited today to be bringing back Howdy McCoskey and an, an amazing researcher who we had to back, uh, I think it was in 2020. I don't know, 2020, 2021, they kind of like just blend together. But we spoke with Howdy in conjunction with John Coleman, kind of a co-interview where we looked at the Chicago World's Fair and how so many inconsistencies are there between the official narrative of how that place was built, what it was for, and what we can actually see from the real world artifacts and photography that are left behind. You can find Howdy's works on Amazon. His page has got three books, Exposing the Expositions, which we talked about then. Also, The Power of Then, a book about revealing Egypt's lost wisdom. And Howdy's book, Falling for Truth, A Spiritual Death and Awakening. All of his books are also available at egyptian-wisdom-revealed.com. And I also highly recommend his YouTube channel, Howdy McCoskey Talks. All of that will be linked in the show notes. And I'm really excited to dive right in. So how you doing? Howdy. Welcome back to Interverse, my friend. Thank you. I'm actually, we've had like a spring finally for like the first week of like the year. So it's like, it feels good to be around. I've noticed that when I look over at you, first you're up at your name. So you've got like a lightning bolt after chance, which is interesting. Yep. And then you're wearing a Susquehanna alchemy shirt. Absolutely. So, yeah. yeah so, my- so Michael's going to be thrilled. <laughs> yeah. Michael's uh, I've shown him, I've, I've showed him the shirt. We we're pretty good buddies. We talk here and there on, on shows and actually a overdue to have him back because he's just like a machine that, has always got more stories to tell. You know what I mean? Like you could have him every week yeah. and be fine. Yeah. Yeah. But well, where uh, would you like, where would you like to go today? Well, I just wanted to open up with maybe you could tell us about some of the things that you've recently been covering on your YouTube channel. I know that you not that long ago talked about the Carrington event and you and I both share some interest in the Dubai world fair which is kind of like a 2020 world fair that actually happened later. (laughs) Uh, Maybe we could talk about just some of your recent interests before I dive into some of the more structured questions I have. Sure. I kind of, yeah, I, I, I've been doing, you know, been doing some Plato's cave stuff for a while and uh, I'm going to, I'm going to start working on that book sometime this, this summer here. Now I'm going to try to get the format down, but in the midst of doing that, yeah, I bumped into the last one was just, it was on the Carrington event, which is supposed to be a 19, an 1859 um, coronal discharge from the sun, a giant plasma wave or, or something like that that hit the earth, uh, causing tremendous, well, we'll call it massive damage, but damage, destroying telegraph lines all over the world, cutting off communication, uh, setting things on fire in the telegraph, um, in the telegraph rooms. Other than that, there were just bright lights in the sky, kind of like the Aurora Borealis all over the earth. But this was I bumped into it because, of course, we're hearing so much about the possibility of the power grid going down, the power grid getting shut down, the Internet getting shut down, an, e- an EMP attack, all of these things. So when you kind of track it, one of the first instances that's being mentioned of anything like this is the Carrington event. OK, it's named after a famous British astronomer who happened by chance to be like looking at looking at the sun when it happened and was able to discover this idea of things coming off the sun hitting the it's earth okay. just on its own just that idea happened to be looking right at the yeah. right time it just happened just by by chance so i got curious i was just going to do a video on it and kind of say there's almost no information on like what i just told you is about all you're going to find anywhere on the internet pretty much when you look into uh science articles on it it doesn't matter and I bumped into another person's YouTube channel from a long time ago. I can't remember his name off the top of my head, something Hubbard. Um, and he did a whole thing in the Carrington event where he, he took out, he has old Encyclopedia Britannicus. 
And so we started looking through Encyclopedia Britannica's because, so we first looked in 1990. The guy, Carrington, the astronomer, he's listed in there. Nothing about this event. He goes back to the, uh, 1930, nothing. 1910, nothing. 1879, there can't be that much in 1879 from the standpoint of astronomical stuff to go into a, a, an encyclopedia. So you would think something like this should make it in, didn't make it in. And that's when I started wondering, I wonder if this happened at all, because it kind of doesn't appear anywhere just about until the year 2000. Now, a few people have tried to tell me that they they were told about it in university somewhere or something like in the 90s, but hard to say. Anyway, it's not in the encyclopedias, and a couple of people have gone looking for it in newspapers from 1859, from September 1859, and they couldn't find anything in the, in the newspapers. Now, this is supposed to shut down uh, communications worldwide. That should make a newspaper. So it's making me wonder, why are they making this story up? Yeah, I mean, that would be the million dollar question. And how much of history is really the same type of deal that it's been inserted later? And what is the point of that? I mean, what comes to mind for me, just off the top of my head, with something like the Carrington event is that it is supportive of uh, heliocentrism, but not just as a astronomical cosmology but as a religious hierarchy you know sun worship the, the I mean, we've got the sun disease yeah. right now there's always so much solar symbolism when you break into etymology of the mythology of the the gods of the so-called planetary bodies they end up going back to solar symbolism too whether it's mercury or jupiter or or uh, saturn you know you can find a time earlier time where that particular character was actually a sun god before it got applied to the wandering stars. So maybe there's something there. Maybe, of course, we, we're we're looking at this uh, two weird things. One one that comes from what you just said, which is, of course, in the ancient world there were always two suns, right? There was seemingly the sun that we know now, and the second one. Some call it a black sun. Some believed it's Saturn. Some believed it's a sun that was there, and then and then was destroyed, but there always seemed to be two. That was really interesting that there was, and, and the one that was really the nurture of the earth is not the one where we have now. It's the one that was lost. So that's one weird element that adds to all this. The second is the timing that if this is true, that information on this event didn't start appearing until like after the year 2000 and really not until the year 2010, and surprisingly, we get a movie called The Carrington Event in 2013, lo and behold. So why as well, not just why are they making the event up, why do they want to make it up? Or at least if it actually was true, let's pretend for just a minute it was true. Why is it basically completely ignored from history for 150 years? And then right here, right in the last uh, 15 years prior to where we are now, now they want to start talking about it. It's obviously got some kind of um, like a, a runaway, like a train that's getting going. And this is like, this is the thing they just, this is the first thing to get the coal put on the train to get the first chugs going down the track. Where is this thing heading? It's obviously heading to something that will happen with the power grid. And they're going to want to start referencing this, this Carrington event at some point in more detail to tell us what we need to be afraid of what to be, what to expect in our near future. So that's why I did the, the video to just kind of get people to think about what is this thing and, and, and what, it, of course, like anything, what does it mean for us right now? That's a really, really good point. Actually, it reminds me of nukes in that way that you create a bunch of fictional self-referential loops in popular culture back to this one idea. But when you dig to the origin of the idea, it doesn't seem to have any actual foundation. And then you have a whole nother layer of weirdness in the sense that if reality is kind of malleable based on our perception, do we maybe even invite such things as becoming possible by mass belief and adoption of a perspective that says that it is? Yeah. I mean, these are all, these are questions that are a big part of this is, 
do how to say it how to say it well is reality somehow dependent on humans and again this is a um this is often i i, I tend not to go this route too far because of course it's a very um self-important kind of belief that this reality is so dependent on us we are so important but there does of course seem to be some correlation between the the mind of the mass you might say and the things that do occur in reality so does does the things that are occurring in reality uh from on a much deeper level do they just create on their own do they just like throw a wave into the matrix you might say a wave into the into the hologram and and create it or is it like they need the second bounce point almost that the if if you can get human minds to be thinking the same way you 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 either maybe crystallize it or you get it put into the matrix much easier that might be a reason for a lot of this stuff is that yeah it can be created but for some reason humans can give a if you can get it into the human thinking you 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 get it deeper and quicker and more crystallized it's just a possibility i don't know yeah um, is there a way that we can maybe weave this into the plato's cave allegory concept like that the mm-hmm. carrington event is a shadow being puppeted onto the wall everything about you know i was just writing the rewriting because I'm, I'm doing a second book at the same time i'm doing a plato's cave and i'm doing a history book right now and the first chapter is is about uh this box of nantes that i have on my uh on my channel uh this weird sarcophagus box in the in the cathedral in the main cathedral in nantes france and um in the course of that discussion there's there's a painting in nantes in the main art gallery it's a it's a last supper but it's a really unique last supper in which the the table is square and it's almost twisted like a baseball the way a a baseball square is turned so it looks diamond like so it's got this kind of twist to it but it's all square and everybody is perfectly positioned along the along the edges of the square but what's most important is there's two curtains like this that have been pulled aside so you're it's like the curtains are there but you're seeing the the inner you're seeing the scene as if the curtains have opened and this is a really important piece because when i first went to the sistine chapel wow 15 years ago or something like that everyone's staring at the ceiling right they're all staring at michelangelo's work on the ceiling but i was staring at the walls and i was staring at the walls because they well they do have beautiful artwork on a lot of the beautiful paintings um um botticelli even has some of the some of the artwork on the on the walls a couple of the walls though are just curtains like not like real curtains they're painted they painted the walls with curtains And of course, at the time, I I know there's a message here. This is not done by accident. I couldn't think what it was, but it's relating to the whole idea of Plato's cave that just like a theater, but, but the, the, whatever's really going on, we don't see it because we're seeing the curtain. We're seeing the screen. We're seeing what's being projected onto the screen over and over and over again. We're seeing the veil of ISIS. And the trick is, is can you open the curtains? Can you get the curtains to open of reality so that you can actually see what's beyond it, what's behind it, or what's really going on? So if we flip that a little bit to what you were just sort of talking about, you might say, obviously, at least the way it's being presented to us, the Carrington event is curtains. It's it's another image on the screen that we're expected to just accept like everything else. And if there's a job, our job is to say, how do I open them up and see what's behind it? And that's kind of what the video was pointing to. There's something behind it, but normally we don't even think to look. Yeah. And in this metaphor, if the curtains are painted on a wall, then it's like another layer of, of uh mind fuckery. Cause you try to pull the curtains apart, but actually they were just painted there in a way that made them look three dimensional and like they were, were a covering, right. but boom, now you're hitting a wall. But I'm, so but I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty us? sure. Is that what we do? Yeah, but I'm pretty sure if I had time in the Sistine Chapel alone, if I could, get, if I could actually get in there by myself uh, and stared at those curtains for like three or four hours, my guess is they might open, even though it's paint, or they might dissolve, or there might be like um, like a holographic layer behind it that you can literally 
with the right kind of meditative thinking, you might say, you'll actually dissolve the curtains and see what's behind it. Because that happened once in ancient Egypt to me that there was a, a layer on the other on the on the other side of the relief, you might say, when you if you get through one, you can get to the next. So I think that's might be what's what's at a place like this. But uh, I didn't get it. Of course, I didn't get an opportunity to try it. Yeah, I would. Uh, I would love it to hear you expand on what you're talking about in your trip to Egypt and looking at the relief and kind of seeing. Yeah, I was. It. Yeah, I was in. Uh, this was in a small temple in near on, on Karnak. Uh, Karnak is a is one of is the largest temple of Egypt, but there are small little temples that are kind of uh, attached to it. You might say still in the enclosure. One is the temple of Khonsu, Khonsu being the uh, um, deity, the Nitur of the moon, so linked to Toth, to Hute. And uh, it gets very few visitors, so it's a great place to go back, back then, especially when there was a lot of people in Egypt. You could go to this little temple and kind of be left alone. And eventually the guards got to know me because I was going many days in a row. So they just, they left me alone completely. I was you know, and I went into one of the rooms. There's, there, there's, of course, like most Egyptian temples, there's a large uh, entryway. Then there's like a columned hall and then rooms fill out from the sides of it. So I went into one of the rooms that was e the most likely that no one was going to bother me, either tourist or guard, and sat down and just, and, and there was enough light that I could see the reliefs on the wall. There was like, you know, I can't remember exactly, but probably it was a seated Osiris and, and a few things going on, lots of hieroglyphs. So I sat there. Uh, in this space for, mm, I'm going to say, an hour, hour and a half, just staring at the at the scene, just being real, really still. And after about an hour and a half, the the, the wall started to shake. Oh, well, not shake, shake. When you when you see like a mirage on on a hot day on the road, the way the the heat did, that's what it looked like. So the whole wall started doing that, had the shiver to it, and then the thing I'd been looking at for the last hour and a half was gone wasn't that was it was a it was a it was still a relief it was still like an ancient egyptian set of carvings i think this one had more uh feminine stuff in it i think there was an isis or a hathor but it was she was in a completely different place from where osiris was the i could tell instantly the hieroglyphs were different i was looking at a completely different relief and then i realized oh my god that there's not just one layer to these things they actually they've actually holographically made them in several layers onto the stone somehow and that depending on your state of being you can access deeper and deeper levels that everyone is spending all their time studying and working on like the first level of relief that which is on the outer part of the wall but it's like literally if you could peel like wallpaper if you peel that off there's another one and there's another one and i don't know how many there might have been but i got the realization that at least there was a second one and it was uh, it was a very I don't want to call it energetic because that's not even the way to describe it. It was, it was it was almost electric. There was almost like an electricity from seeing it, and I got it for about ten or fifteen minutes, and then I was started thinking a little bit. I was figure trying to figure out what I saw, and again it shivered, went away, and the original one was back. It was uh, yeah, quite a thing. Yeah, that's remarkable. It makes me think of some of my experiments in shamanic techniques of defocalization of one's gaze that's kind of the idea mm. that first of all you're not like in that normal mode of thinking everything that you're looking at but also you're not focused in the same way you're letting the edges blur you're letting what yeah. else is there kind of come through and this is really interesting because yeah, i've because been I've, I've been wondering about like this idea of this we're in a matrix or a matrix or plate it Plato's like, cave, that yeah. type of thing. And uh, that we've got multiple layers to our body that it, maybe it's not so much that we're Ooh. trapped or in, in a prisoned planet, but we just forgot how to expand our consciousness to be localized in other layers of the body besides just this one part of the shell, which really is almost like just a shell. <laughs> and you're seeing holographic carvings, multiple layers of artistry i mean that's like the astral expression of something maybe these artists that created these things are working on more than one layer of reality at once maybe in their dream time they're going back to their tools and carving the holographic astral version of the relief at the same time 
It's also interesting that this occurred at the Temple of Kansu because I've been thinking about Kansu lately, trying to figure out why uh, the big D Disney is putting out this show right now called Moon Knight, which is all about Kansu actually choosing an avatar to go and like do oh, violence yeah, like upon violence. evildoers. Evildoers. Are you serious? Yeah, yeah. It's called Moon Knight. And to make it even more interesting, the uh, the character in this show, Moon Knight, who is the avatar of Kansu, has at least three has at least three disassociative personality disorder identities, which is another thing that Disney and TikTok and mass media is pushing right now that disassociative identity disorder is cool, right? Like they, they were doing that with autism for a while that you want to identify as autistic. There's people on Twitter, young people, their, their bio literally is like hashtag actually autistic. Actually autistic. Now it's a disassociative identity disorder that is like the, that is a like trendy that. thing. And Disney's pushing that with their Moon Knight TV show right now. I just quickly looked into it while you were talking to me. Cause I mean, I believed you, but I didn't, I, at the same time I had to just verify it. Like, wow. And, and they're choosing, I mean, Kansu is a pretty obscure deity in ancient Egyptian. If, if you ask some people who've studied ancient Egypt a little bit and ask for like 10 deities, that's not going to be in there. Osiris, Isis, Ptah, Hathor, Sekhmet, you know, not going to be Kansu, right? So that this t- television series has chosen that particular one for their show is also really bizarre. Needless to say, I'm going to have to look into this a little deeper because um, you, you what unfortunately, you're talking about you, you, just the show, open, you just opened a door. <laughs> well, what you're talking about occurs in the show in the sense that this character has got this disassociative identity disorder. He is seeing layers of reality on top of our physical reality that other people aren't seeing. And it's part of why he's he thinks he's insane or people think he's insane. And uh, they even say in the show that Kansu has been banished by the other gods. And that's why he's like unknown, unpopular. And he's kind of uh, he's kind of a jerk but also a just jerk. <laughs> it's a, it's a really weird show. Yeah. And of course, Kansu, when you, when you look into, at least as it's understood from an ancient Egyptian idea, like I say, is an aspect of Tehute, just like Sekhmet and Bastet are aspects of Hathor. They are, they are Hathor, but they're parts of Hathor, right? So Kansu is part, a part of Tehute, Tehute being Hermes uh, eventually in Greek. Um, time so you're talking about writing and and wisdom and hermetic knowledge and alchemy and all of these kind of things and so uh the second part that when you're talking about the moon the moon always has this idea of reflection i don't believe it's actually reflecting but that's how it's presented this idea of, of this reflective element um and so a sort of a reflective wisdom or a, a wisdom that is um a little less overt it's 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 a it's a little different way to obtaining the wisdom than you normally think when you when you're working with the moon i know the the, the korean monk that i was with for uh, a year or so the first part of his training he classified as as kwang which was sun and that was removing the darkness from your heart so that you could be you could be uh, light he called it the light happy but he said the second stage was myung which is moon which is learning how to reflect, which in his case was, I guess, reflecting uh, reality back to itself so that you weren't going to be taking reality in. You were, you were, it was like you became like a mirror and reflected it back to reality so that you were in a sense, not being, I, I'm this, and I'm not sure we didn't, not many of us got to this point to even begin hearing about it, but when a little, I can figure out from it, this idea of like your, you're reflecting reality back on itself so that you're keeping a clean screen, you might say. Then there was a third stage, which he never told any of us because I guess he thought none of us were ever going to get there. It kind of makes, <laughs> makes me think of uh, something I heard the other day that in South America, some of the priests of, you know, the ziggurat giant pyramids yeah. in, in that culture would 
have pools of water on top of their structure and they would watch the stars through the pool of water. They would look at the reflection mm. of the stars. They weren't looking straight up at it. That's kind of what right. it makes me think of. And I mean, maybe again, oddly enough in this TV show, I'm, I'm bringing up the way that the, um, the main character speaks to his alter personalities is when he's looking in the mirror, the image in the mirror will be one of the others of himself and he can talk to them that way. So very, very much in that idea of the reflective that you're talking about. No. And it's like, and I just see, it just like started, right? It started like last month. Yeah. It just started like last month. I think it's going to be six episodes and they've done three or four. Holy cow. Well, I I know what I'm going to, I know what I'm going to be doing tomorrow now. Like, you know, my, my day chances has ruined my nice summer, uh, my nice spring day tomorrow, because that's all I'm going to be doing is looking into oh, this just show. Save it, like, save it for when it gets dark. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm grateful, of course. I'm actually, I'm grateful, of course, every time this kind of stuff comes up, but it just, it's going to, I know it's going to blow my mind when I start looking into it, like what they're probably actually revealing in this thing, what they're, what they're hinting at, what they're, what they're using these symbols to, to do. Well, what I found, wow. so this is something that is going on in that show, a little bit of a spoiler, but I already told you he's the avatar. So the other gods have yeah. avatars that are human beings that are actually tied to and connected to that particular god. And I'm wondering, you know, have you ever had that thought that the, the gods as archetypal forces, you know, the zodiac, all these different divisions of source that we can look at at a higher octave of reality in a sense of a less divided octave of reality. I've looked at that as maybe human beings on this level of division, part of this concept of being able to localize your consciousness in different layers of the self or of reality rather than just this one shell, which really does feel like that outermost shell that uh, in some sense, each of us in this 8 billion level of division are like within the pie wedge of a lesser division or a higher octave. And in a sense, like some of us are in Hermes zone. Some of us are in Mars zone. Some of us are Jupiter. Like we are kind of avatars of the archetypes in that way, but there's probably more overlap than that. It's just sort of a a ramble thought. Yeah. It's those ideas, you know, are we just cells of a greater being that, you know, the greater being looks at us, it's just like a neutron and electron, but we think of ourselves as real people having real experiences. And so what are, is there a chance cell in my body? Is there, you know, is one way of looking at it, microcosm of macrocosm going on and on and on. Um, I know from my own personal experiences that, um, you know, I, I've, I've had experiences of, of, I guess you call them parallel realities or alternate lives where I'm, I'm, I've had experiences of myself living a different life, but this life, this body, this whatever. I've even seen myself die in in one of them. I've seen different jobs I've had, different women I've been married to, different, I mean, literally, but it's just, and I could see how all of the things um, that I witnessed in those other lives were, were very possible. It just took a little would have taken a little turn here, a little turn there. Probably if I would have just said no to that or yes to that, that would have been enough to create what I had seen. And, and it makes sense. I mean, if one of the reasons, you know, they're back to why, why are we in existence? Why is this existence even here? Right. What is the point of this whole thing? And if, if, if it's experience, if some, if, and especially if it's a simulation, a simulation wants experiences, right? You, you run, you run a simulation, thousands of hundreds, thousands of times to get various uh, results. So you can try to find a median range of, you know, likelihood. It would make sense that there would be a million of us having a million different lives because you would then have 1 million times the experience rather than just one life, one shot, one set of experience, that's it. So it actually makes sense on one level that there must be that, that I, that I must've been seeing something quite realistic where I was seeing multiple me's. It just makes sense. Why, Why only have one 
one avatar, one life with that one experience of that avatar, why not go through everything the avatar could possibly experience realistically within the framework? You know, there's certain things I will never, I will never become the quarterback of the Dallas Cowboys, right? It doesn't matter how many times I go back to age five, I'm never going to gain the skills to be a, a an NFL quarterback. That's just not in my genetics. Right. But there's 10 million billion other things I could potentially do in this realm. So I think that kind of I'm taking as an offshoot of what you just said, this idea that as soon as we step back and kind of recognize there might be a million me's having a million experiences right now, currently, you know, with time being no with time being as it as it is, no actual time, no linear time. And that uh, that might lead. I was talking about this, this idea of, of bleeding uh, in where other lives bleed into your life. This happens a lot to me at, when I sleep at night where I would have a dream and I'd wake up maybe I, you know, I'd spend time with somebody or I, I, I'm in the dream. I was doing something I'm like, I know that person. I mean, like, I, they're like one of my best friends. Like, but what is this person's name? What is this guy's name? Where did I meet him? How, how do I know? But I know, like, I know it's not just a dream character. I know this person I've spent the, the, what I'm watching was not a dream. It was real, but I have no recollection in my own life when I could have met him, but I know I did. And it would make sense if I had some sort of bleed from another life that was coming in and in the dream. All of these things are open for really deep consideration and, and, and discussion. This is very interesting because it does what you're saying does tie into. And when you watch that show, you're going to be like, whoa, because, you know, he's, he's got mo multiple personalities and they have very different personalities and skill sets. And okay, uh, it makes one wonder if there is some mechanism that humans have lost a touch with where we could access our other selves in a time mm -hmm. of necessity or that like, you know, today I want to practice painting, but instead of being a level one painter, I could tap into the version of myself that has spent all the time in the, in the life Ooh. working on it and express from that level of mastery. Right. I mean, wouldn't that oh. allow for the function of a, a spiritual multiversal simulation to be way more beneficial and uh, sensible for why it would, why it would be. And maybe part of the illusion of separation isn't just the illusion that we are separate beings from each other and separate from nature, but also the illusion of separation from all of our vast, infinite potential uh, expressions of self across a, you know, an infinite multiverse. Wow. This is quite a talk, isn't it? Um, <laughs> 30 minutes actually, in, we're I already mean, like at the level thousand. Yeah, no, I, I'm hoping that the people watching this are really, really going to enjoy this because this is, this is, this is another level of importance and, and got to be honest, I had never thought of that. I had never thought of, hey, I've got a problem with my car. Uh, I need to fix the, you know, the carburetor with something, but there's probably, there's a million me's, one of them must have become proficient in auto mechanics. Why wouldn't I tap in then to the self, to the, to the self that's me that knows how to do that just in the instant that I need to have, like you say, have that information, use it, do it, then I don't need it anymore. What a thing where then it doesn't matter what skills we gain in our life. We don't have to be rushing to learn everything if we knew that this was true and we knew this. We didn't, wouldn't have to learn everything. We would just need to become proficient in one or two things, knowing that, okay, that's helpful here, but it's going to help. It's, I'm going to allow that to tap into one million other me's. Like you say, the painting is available. I'm the one that's painting, so I know how to do it. And all the rest of you, just when you want to paint, tap in. But make sure, yeah, I can tap in when I need to fix my car or I need to go fishing or I need to whatever. What a, what a, what a concept. And what, of course, if you were making a gigantic interconnected web of possibility, what a way to do it where you don't have to learn everything. You just have to learn a few things and tap into your own self to learn who's figured out the other stuff. Honestly, that is. Brilliant. Yeah, I think there could be something there because, and it could apply to more than just skills, really. Think yeah. about the times where you hear of uh, the mother 
hulking out and lifting a car off of her baby all of a sudden, even though they're not nice. strong. You know, there could be something similar going on there. In my own experience with it, energy work, energy healing type things, the, uh, the idea of intuition comes to mind. Like, why do we sometimes just know the right thing to do, even in a situation that we don't have any memorable experience within? For me, I will, when I'm working with clients, new, new situations will come up with a client, something going on with them that I've never seen before. And it always happens in sort of an order from client to client where the idea of how to deal with that situation will spontaneously arise for me in an intuitive way, just as I need to learn that way of doing things. And then what I learn will apply to future situations very frequently, but it just sort of comes in at the moment I need it. And so I think maybe beyond just a, parallel lives of the same chance it could yeah. apply to past life abilities skills knowledge um strengths you know and i've had in in psychedelic journeys long ago i'm i feel like i've been in the hall of mirrors like an infinity chamber where i can mm, see where i can see along the line along both the both directions all these different me's that were converging at that point at the same time also having that type of an experience you know so i think that we are connected to our supreme being infinite aspect of self much more strongly all the time than we believe but that belief is really the sort of the barrier in a way belief can mm. be the curtain belief that we don't have that connection so just opening up to the idea could alter our realities from this point forward for all we know. Yeah. Here's a, here's a thing to test in one of your next healing sessions. Just, this is a curiosity now from what we're talking about. How about when you're, when you, okay, you've got somebody and, and you've, and you've got a pretty good idea what's, what's wrong with them physically and spiritually. Can you tap into one of their other lives where they are totally healthy then and move energy so now the energy is not coming from the universe. The energy is coming from the healthy version of them, of that person from the same age. And some of that energy just redirects because then you're actually using their own energy, their own, uh, their own structure virtually. I wonder if that would do something. I'm just saying that as like a science experiment. That actually makes a lot of sense because one of the ways that I describe, so the work I do currently is using tuning forks and this resonance technology, coherent sound that allows the body to auto-correct its own frequencies, your own cellular vibration. Mm -hmm. But one of the examples I like to use when I describe how, how and why this works or do my best to describe it because there's still plenty to ascertain about it is that that phenomenon where you take a bunch of metronomes and you put them in the same room and you set them off at different times and you come back later and they're all ticking together in perfect sync, right? right? So you wouldn't even need to be taking energy from anywhere per se, if you could, if you could link up the person's up body the person's to body. the frequency, for lack of better words, of their healthy variant okay, somewhere else in the time stream, then their body would auto-correct because that's kind of how nature works. If you put harmony and disharmony together, if you put coherence and dissonance together, yeah, coherence wins coherence out wins the dissonance out. adapts to the coherence in the end it's sort of an auto correcting system like that it just needs nature just needs the template of wholeness to then um you know correct itself that's sort of how i see it anyway interesting and i think that this is an interesting concept too when we to tie it into some of your work and I've been really interested in researching lately extra <laughs> the uh, resonance architecture, the antiquitech. Maybe that has something to do with how all that works with pulling energy from the ether with the just feel sort of subtle field generation that was probably being uh, created by the cathedrals and the ancient architecture that is so magnificent. You know, do you have any thoughts on how that technology worked in the sense of a, a free energy technology? Not specifically. I mean, that, that's how I got started in studying the World Fairs to start with. I was in Florence 
in, uh, I guess, January, fe February 2019, just a year before all the craziness in the world began. And I was there studying the cathedrals. I was there trying to get a sense of how the cathedrals actually worked as, um, as energy centers, as energy structures. Um, the most I was able to uh, figure out from that trip was it seemed like <clears throat> a few things were happening. So one was the exact center of the church, the cathedral, is always an, uh, an open area, you know, it's, it's, the, the, the people tend to sit there, but there's, a, there's also a sec, usually there's a second dome over top of the, uh, the altar or the, the pulpit, I guess it's called in, in Catholicism, right? And my, my feeling is so that the energies, one is being pulled down from, from the sky somehow through the domes, through the towers. And the, the, they seem like they needed, um, copper was one of the big things. So if you look at these old structures, they all had the roofs had either copper on them or at least copper pieces or copper statues were a part of them. Some have these balls. I, mean, I guess you've seen these like giant balls. And I've heard, I've, I mean, obviously I have not been able to get to the top of a cathedral in Europe and open one up, but they're supposed to have liquid mercury in them or did have liquid mercury in them. Possibly red mercury. That's, yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't know. But, um, uh, the, the the question being that if they if they try to get get it out of people's hands if they don't want them to to have mercury then there must be something really positive to it right if they don't want humans to have it then there must be some reason for it so um, my my so the feeling was is this energy is coming down from the top then you've got the energy coming from the earth and I don't feel I couldn't feel it everywhere in the cathedral so it's not like it's universal it's like but there there would be points where there would be really strong energy in my feet and almost every ancient almost every cathedral and I'm sure if you started digging into the famous other buildings of of the sort of the 18 1800s or or this time period we're talking about. Uh, we're all built on something. Usually, you know, every cathedral was built on a like like the Temple of Isis, a Temple of Diana, a Temple of Jupiter, a, a stone circle, uh, whatever, uh, an old Indian medicine wheel, something. So you're you're also you've got the energy of the spot where the Earth's meridians are crossing, where the it's just like an uh, just like an uh, it's like an acupuncture needle placed on this point on the Earth. So you've got that coming up. It's got the energy coming up, and they're meeting in the middle. Then I noticed that the, the there's there's like a side there's like your middle area of the church. I'm not good with all the names of these things, but the the side areas of the of a cathedral or a church. There's always like these these side passages. I got the sense when the energy came down and met in the middle, it started circulating inside the church, but around the outside, not in the middle. It kind of moved, and it just kept moving. And my sense was two things needed to happen. One was the organ had to be played that the organ was like a directional tool for the energy in the cathedral to move. And depending on what was played would depending on which of the rose windows, the energy would move to because those rose windows are cymatic patterns. So when you, when you, when you do the cymatic wave stuff, it's the, it's the cathedral rose windows. And if you know the cymatic pattern, you can know exactly what the energy frequency of that uh, rose window is. And once the energy, I think it's once the organ music <laughs> connecting to the human organs, once the organ music is played, I think the energy moves out the rose window and then gets even more amplified through that cymatic wave pattern out into its environment. Now, the other thing that was really, really interesting, and then I'll shut up and let you talk was if you noticed, uh, I don't know how, how many trips you had to Europe by chance, but most old European cities, the front, especially of like these sort of like, you know, the apartments that are three or four stories high, they're not really big, but they're, they're like, they all had iron, uh, like iron uh, gates and, or not gates, but iron, um, iron uh, outside, almost like little, uh, walls for their like uh, decks or whatever you want to call them, little balconies. Oh, but it was all, or the front of the windows was always iron. And I think that's not again accident that there's something in the metal that was drawing in the energy coming out of the cathedrals and the other buildings that was being attracted to this, to these uh, metal things on the outside of the building, the outside of the people's homes. And then that was transferred inside. And I wouldn't doubt that there was, again, something inside all of the old apartments or, or, or businesses or whatever, then that transferred that energy into whatever was used in the house. That's my best attempt at trying to describe it but that's just uh that's just my guess uh from from studying it and looking into it but I, I get a sense i'm on the right track but of course probably not exactly right 
No, I think we're on the right track here. The, right uh, track. The, the iron being magnetic is a big, important factor too. Iron is very magnetic. So in the columns of these buildings, you know, you look at the domes and there are columns in a circle that the dome is sitting on top of a lot of the time. Right. And if you deconstruct the columns, they're not just oh, stone. Not just they have stone. like iron bars inside of them. So, so um, if you think about like a horseshoe magnet, like which horseshoe. is iron, the yeah. magnetic field magnetic is constant field and consistent, is constant. right? And maybe that has something to do with the structure of like there being wings of the building. Wings of the building. Maybe they're creating, yeah, they're creating a consistent magnetic field that is just always there. Maybe that's what you're feeling in your feet in certain parts of the building. And if you've got a magnetic field and you have everything sort of wired up with the the iron that's running through the building and with this ether ether drawing antennae from up top mm. that are pulling from the etheric ionosphere. Uh, and then, you know, there are these cavities, these octagonal cavities in all these buildings too, usually under the domes, sometimes in other places, but makes you wonder right. was there a type of vessel there or an engine of some kind is this where the mercury comes into play because uh this was something i learned recently always more to learn about mercury but when you put an electromagnetic charge into mercury it spins it vortexes like rapidly so this could be sort of like we have you know hydroelectric power where you're rushing water to cause something to spin or turn and then that turning is generating electricity what if part of the free energy was simply that they set up a magnetically resonant architecture and there was a mercury engine that was just always vortexing because of this field strength that was there and that that was generating some sort of a charge that would distribute throughout the building and maybe light things up you know and then we have no need for a fuel this would just be a perpetual motion uh, system that's kind of where I'm at right now, but I'm sure there's so much more to it. But it's amazing how simple it would be something like that compared to the, you know, burning of fossil fuels and all of the moving parts that so easily break and need oiled. And what we currently are doing is like barbarically primitive. Well, I know from my, like, when I go to ancient sites, and I'll just use stone circles as a really good example. Um, there's, I've come into like 50 or 60 of them here in Norway where, where I live now. And um, what's, what's interesting about the stone circles when I go to them is not just that there's, there's an energy itself of the, of the circle itself. Each stone has its own energy, but there's always like one spot and it's not necessarily in the middle. I have to like, like walk around almost like a, uh, in a spiral around it. And there'll be, but there'll be one spot somewhere in the circle that is where the energy's off the chart. And it's like, sometimes I can only stand on that spot for one or two minutes before like my, my legs start to feel like they're going to burn. But if I take a step, one step over, then it's just a good energy. It's good. You know, it's like, so there's also, it seems like somehow they, they, they were creating these energy vortexes, these energy frequency fields, these energy whatevers. But there was always there was always like a central dot to them somehow. There was always this one place that had uh, that 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 got the 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 focus of it all. At least that's what every stone circle I've been to has showed me. And so, same with like the Egyptian temple, same with everything else. There's always a there's always a point. There's one spot that that is beyond all. And it's not just me. I can take others and kind of ask them stand on these eight different spots. What's the one that has the strongest energy and, you know, in nine out of 10, tell me the same spot. So I know it's not just me. It, it, it's, it's, it's measurable to other people who can feel any kind of energy. So, uh, so when we take that back to this idea, like we're talking about vortexes and the creation of energy and, and, and whatnot, it'd be also interesting to see if there's if there's central points being created or 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 parts of these energy creation vortexes have a for some reason need to have a greater strength than others for the whole to be uh, electrified yeah i mean this actually just takes me back to the idea of the that we started on the, the hidden sun <laughs> the black sun the central sun right because in some alternate cosmologies of the earth shape 
not being a sphere. sphere. You have a North Pole a North central Pole. vortex with like a hidden sun uh, there in a way that what we see as sun and moon are type of plasma again with the idea of reflections they're kind of like plasma reflections and the idea like similar to how if you take sunlight and you get a mirror and you shine it so that that light focuses into a beam and a point that point gets really right. hot right you can burn holes to things that maybe what we see as the sun is actually that phenomenon off the dome like that the 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 firmament is reflecting okay. a single point and it, you know whether okay, so or not that's the case i think that there is something to this idea of like a polar vortex of a a central polar vortex that this architecture is also reflecting in the sense that there's a point in there where it's like really strong for sure what we can know at least one thing we can figure out for sure that doesn't take we don't need all sort of scientific experiments and tools and whatever the 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 distance between us and the sun is not what they tell us that we know that for sure it is much much closer just because based on the way the rays of something should go from such a such a distance um doesn't work because there's so many times when you can have the sun just being on a particular small little area and it's not like on the sides of where you are which is impossible if the sun is where they say that it's supposed to be so we know whatever the sun is whether it's a real thing a light uh, a plasma ball uh, a reflection uh, whatever it's relatively close so knowing that it's relatively close makes us wonder what it is and it makes us wonder or it should make people wonder what's is there anything really beyond it because so much of science is based on this idea of this vast infinite universe right this giant a, a way it's described vast space now maybe we have so maybe we do have something vast but it's nothing like the way it's described to us that that's a complete uh, that's a complete hoax and maybe maybe we do have maybe we are a part of something quite vast but because we're not being given any kind of clues to start thinking about it no one's catching what it really is right uh looking at people's home yeah. astronomy with their p9000 nikons looking up at stars really close zoomed in you get those cymatic patterns that you see in the rose windows they look nothing like the big fiery gas giants fiery that NASA gas tells us they are so Right. That is an amazing mystery. And they're like colorful and dancing. People should look into like close up zoomed in star footage if they've never seen that. Right. But in the, um, I have plenty of places to return us to when we get to the second hour. But I want to ask you a more <laughs> down to earth question as I, as I put it. I feel sure. I like to field some questions from my audience community on Telegram and see what people would like to hear you speak about. And one of the best questions that came up, and I feel like it's a good place to lead us for the, uh, the end of the first hour to maybe draw out some inspiration is uh, from our buddy, Sean, who I call an etheric encoder. He wants to know, since you've been in this game for the long haul, how do you keep it fresh energetically? He says, I know recently he found renewed meaning and energy when he moved house and got gifted a new laptop and all that goodness from his community. So he's, his question, he says, is more related to the underlying heartbeat of his work and his pursuit of purpose. Wow, really good question. Um, I, think, I think for me, I've come to realize that it is there's there's something in writing for me that even though we're we've moved out of a world where books and writing don't seem to be as important to everyone else, but this is kind of even now, I hate to say it, if I need to find some information on something, I'll go to you I'll find it easier at a YouTube video than I will on a on a website now. And and but for me, the actual process of writing is like an inner journey. So when I'm going to begin this Plato's cave work, it's going to, I know it's, I'm, I've kind of been in a bit of a lull for a couple of years. I can say that because I stopped once the two books were done and I stopped the writing portion of things and went totally to doing interviews and, and my channel, which I've been, it's been wonderful. It's been a, a great experience. I've been, it's been easier and harder than I thought it would be when I first started both, both at the same time. But now I feel that, 
for me to go to the next depth, I have to write because some something in the process of having to stop clearly and put things on paper and have to put it in such a way that I think if 10,000 people read this, will they all understand what I mean? And I don't get a second chance. I can't go back and say it later. So it really forces me to dig through what's going to be on the page. So the way I dig through what's going to be on the page is I have to find um, an experience that I can link to whatever it is I'm going to write, where in some way the feeling will enter, will enter the what's on. I actually do all my writing with an actual pen on paper. I don't, I can't really, I can't really write like I just transfer it onto the laptop after I, I write pen and paper. So literally it's, it's like old school. It's going through my hand onto the paper. So for me, I think this, how I'm going to keep it fresh for me is a, an entirely new project, a really important project that not just for myself, but I think for anyone else who's going to want to read it. And to do that, I'm going to have to spend time in nature to let nature speak to me, you might say, to open new doorways that are at this point closed to my understanding. So it makes me excited to see what's going to come. And the move that he talked about that, yeah, I just have recently moved to, to a new farm. And I get the sense that the nature here is different than where I was. It doesn't look necessarily different, but I think energetically it's different. And once the snow goes in four or five weeks and I get my planting done and, and the garden's ready and I can actually get out there, I think there's going to be some really interesting things coming up. So for me, it's this sense of, and I hate to make it sound like, you know, new agey hope, like, because I don't want it to sound like that. It's, it's this just, but it's just the sense that when you're aligned to your way of doing things, you have to kind of keep doing it. If you want to keep walking your path, each of us has a type of a type of way that we, we, we explore ourselves in reality. Mine just happens to be, writing with a pen on paper and it's and when i slow down for reasons and don't do that things and the knowledge kind of slows down and now i'm ready to pick it up again so long answer to sean's question but that's kind of for me it's it, it would be what is your what is your main track that kind of keeps you as your as your investigative tool that keeps you somehow on track and as long as you keep doing whatever that little tiny little thing is I think you'll keep the universe will keep giving you a new door to open. That's a really good answer. I can definitely relate. Like for me doing this, this is like me putting mm -hmm. pen on paper. Although I also have just this year, well, kind of late last year, learned the value of putting pen value to paper pen in a journaling practice and, and uh, getting my thoughts out that way. And it is, there's something is about that kinetic about transfer of energy from thought to physical reality that, uh, there's a, there's a lot to that. <laughs> uh, yeah. Cool that you got the opportunity to garden out there. And I'm happy that the, the lay of the land has some positive energetic feeling to it. You know, the, the magic of place is a real thing. So um, can yeah. we let people know all the ways that they can connect with you, support you, follow your yes. work. We know that your Plato's cave book is coming up and also another book on history, but yeah, well, uh, kind of give them the rundown on on all the things Howdy McCoskey, especially sure. how they can support you. Yeah, that's great. Uh, thanks, I appreciate that because I yeah I do have the YouTube channel Howdy McCoskey Talks, and then it's it, it links over to Bitshoot. I, I one there. I have some things that have gone on FreeVoice.io, but I, I don't uh, I don't do any of those things for money. All of those things are always uh, there's no paywalls in any of the stuff that I do in my video stuff. I, so it's always free and open for everybody. And I want to try to keep it that way. So the support can come through either purchasing one of my books, which you can find, you can find for information on Amazon or my website. Um, but you don't have to buy them there. They're, you can pretty much go anywhere you want and you'll be able to track them down. But that's, that's one of the ways that I get, not only do I get financial support from that, but I get the support of somebody going through reading my work and maybe possibly passing the book on to somebody else, which is also a thing that's I find really important to me are sharing the work with somebody else that to me, that's so important for one of the reasons I write the books. And then I have my PayPal, um, just a PayPal donation place as a way of also saying thank you and supporting um, the research and the work I do, because it's, it's this really, I've got this really hard dichotomy of like everyone, I need to have money to live and I need to have money to pay rent and, and food and whatever else. And so I, I have to, 
bring money in from the, where I, where I put my effort and where I put my time, but the teachers that I've had in the course of my life, a uh, Zen monk and several native Indian medicine men, they never charged for anything that they did openly and never, never, never forced me to pay anything. Everything I gave was always by donation or cause I, I felt it was time. I felt it was the right time to say thank you for something that they'd been doing for me. And they were, ve- they were very clear the reason why you do that. They said that as soon as you turn wisdom or knowledge into a totally an organ, a profession, you lose the potential of how far you can go in your power. It's not like your power will get taken away, but there could be a point where certain things need uh, a real selfless type of way to it for the universe to give you certain little uh, opportunities. So I, I've been living in this this area of finding ways that yeah, people who like what I do and, and the time I put in can support me, but yet at the same time, I don't want to ever say to someone, I don't want you can't you can't have I can't want to ever say you can't have access to what I'm trying to share because you don't have the money to to to, to buy it. So that's the short overview of how I've been trying to live my life and and hopefully that's still navigating me well as I go through the future. Yeah, man, I totally feel you. The healer's paradox <laughs> need reciprocity, but also we want to we want to live in a world where everything freely flows big time. And uh, I think reframing the way we do things so that it's gifts for gifts is a really good way of uh, sort of changing the spin of the energy just by relabeling. But in the second hour, of course, I, like, I knew when I was with my medicine people, I knew that if I and I didn't usually bring them money, but I might go buy them a whole giant bag, a couple of bags of groceries and bring groceries to their house so they had food to eat. And I knew they needed it. They appreciate, or maybe that may, one time a, a pitchfork was uh, broken at a sweat lodge. So you get a new pitchfork or something. So it, it, there's always ways you can say thank you and 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 yeah, provide things that are actually needed. It's one thing to just get somebody something. It's another thing to get somebody something that they need. Um, that's powerful, actually. That's really, really powerful. And because it shows not only are you giving, it shows you know the person so deeply, you know what they need in the moment. So, yeah, like you say, Chance, there's so many different ways this can happen in reality. And it's just all of us sometimes need to need to look a little outside the box of what are the best ways to say thank you. And like you say, have this the the, the exchange part and the and the uh, the goods and, and things we use move freely with us between all of us as well. Beautiful. Yes. Beautiful. Well, everybody, we'll see you guys on the uh, second hour of the plus extension. I've got a lot of questions relating to the internet. Very interested in the dead internet idea and how, you know, our higher self may predict things through us and through our language. And uh, appreciate everyone for tuning in. Definitely support Howdy's work and watch out for his new books when those come out. And thanks for being here, man. Thank you. We'll see you in a bit. can I encapsulate the magic of that conversation with Howdy? Howdy McCoskey. Always loved that guy, but felt like we had, it felt like we hit a new level in terms of uh, collaboratively this time. It is only our second chat in terms of a long form conversation, but dang, the energy was strong. Energy was so strong. I'll tell you about what we got into in the second hour later, but 
we really hit a lot of topics and yet wove them all together. It was very weavingly <laughs> perfect. Thank you, Howdy. I hope everybody out there goes and subs to his YouTube channel and enjoys the free content he's putting out. And, you know, if you've never investigated the World's Fair mystery, first of all, the video that he and I did back with uh, John Coleman, whenever that was, I um, don't have it pulled up right now, very worth checking out. So if you go into my archives and find the other episode with Howdy, by the way, you can search for episodes on my website. There is a search feature built into my website or probably just Googling Interverse Howdy McCoskey, you would find it. So be aware that dead as the internet may be, <laughs> I have got the SEO pretty well set up, even considering censorship. And you ought to be able to find, you know, if you're looking for a particular person or you wonder if I've talked to a particular person, for example, our mutual friend, me and, uh, me and Howdy's mutual friend, Michael Wan. I'm repping his shirt right now, Susquehanna Alchemy. If you're looking for Michael Wan episodes on Interverse, go to my website or Google search and type in their name. Now, I will say, I guess this is just like now that I'm thinking about it, I don't have pages on my site set up for individual Vibrant episodes. So if you're looking for somebody who has appeared on Vibrant, you wouldn't find it that way. Bummer. I just realized that I probably should start. And as I said that somebody posted in my vibrant call in line. That's funny. So yeah, universe is giving me the wink and the nod. Hey, take, you know, take the time, do the full work, put your episodes on the, uh, put your episodes on the website. If you can hear my dog barking in the background, I'm sorry. I think my dad just showed up to drop something off and my dog is in the backyard and he's probably barking his head off. So we're going to just roll through it because I don't want to end this outro flow that I'm on because I'm really enjoying it. Man, so one of the most surprising aspects of the conversation with Howdy just now was talking about Kansu and the new Disney Marvel show Moon Knight and how weirdly appropriate it is that this is coming up right now. Uh, Howdy says he's going to be making a video after he investigates this show and his his topic of his trip to that uh, that temple of Khonsu in Karnak, Egypt, very fascinating, very fascinating. And seeing through the veil and seeing the higher vibrational holographic overlay of physical reality and that maybe this art, these creations, these sculptures, these structures have an etheric or an astral layer to them that is also crafted, not just a physical craft and that, man, we are very limited by being localized in a single layer of our body and of our existence and just this outer shell. Fascinating stuff. So uh, before I continue, let's talk about what was in the plus extension. You can get the second hour of this talk, like any of the second hours of my show on Rockfin, R-O-K-F-I-N slash Interverse or dot com slash Interverse. Just go to the description. You know, there's links to all this in the show notes of every episode, wherever you're looking at it. You can also get it on Patreon. So Patreon is a $5 a month deal and you get just my stuff, but you get everything I ever did. And Rockfin, $10 a month, but you get access to the entire network of creators and their premium content. And um, happy to do a lot of things for free, but there's got to be at least some way of reciprocity becoming a channel between me and you. So second hour of Interverse episodes are for subscribers or for supporters only. A small monthly gift from you and a uh, frequent weekly gift from me to you <laughs> in the form of the extended version of the conversation. And you know, it just gets more juicy after we've already been going an hour and warmed up and everything we talked about in the second hour dud, does, did, and will, and always does continue to link back into and weave into the first hour topics and expand on them. So, okay, plus topics this time around. I asked him about the Cahuica mounds or just mound building culture in general. Yeah, that's sort of an offshoot of and an expansion on the stone circles topic that came up in the first hour and how the specifically the Cahuica mounds connect to the St. Louis World's Fair. That led us into talking about the circuit board earth concept, like the John Levi idea of, uh, you know, all these cities and all the connecting lines between them and roads and how all of this is very much like a 
an organic internet of sorts. I brought up Chatsworth House, which was a fascinating particular specific example of etheric technology being applied to farming and then to the water, water networks as the etheric internet, basically, you know, versus the, the dead internet that we have right now. And then we talked about the book of coming forth by day and the weighing of the heart ritual, which led us to discussing Ptah, Neph, Vulcan, the creator. Vulcan's not an Egyptian God, but we were specifically more talking Egyptian stuff. But I, we wove it into other versions of these pantheons, including the idea of Vulcan, Falconelli, and the creator artificer of the material world as a concept, a demiurg concept. Talked about the theory that the U.S. is the biblical ancient Egypt and what may or may not hold water about that theory. The possibility. Okay, then how he started talking about his research and his, his current project where he's writing about the idea that France may be the location of the historical events in the New Testament. What is historical about it? Whoa. <laughs> you know, that led me to get into the idea of euharimism and how mythology is applied to history and historical characters. And that muddies the water in the sense that sky clock allegory is put on top of and overlaid on top of maybe real events and could definitely be what's going on in the New Testament. And then all the people that fight over, like, is it historically true? Is it all allegory? Is it all fiction? Well, maybe it's both things getting mixed up together. And that would definitely make a very divisive recipe in terms of all of us fighting over which of those is it? Is it this or that? Well, maybe yes and. And uh, then we talked about the dead internet theory, which was actually what I wanted to talk to Howdy in the first place about. That was what led me to hit him up for another conversation because I think like six months ago, I heard him talking about dead internet theory with Michael Wan and Emily Moyer. And finally, we wrapped up the plus hour, which was jam packed with more talk about Kansu, the mysterious hidden god Kansu moon god in modern culture an aspect of thoth or tahuti freaking fascinating so definitely look out for more howdy content on this concept in the near future probably about the same time that this comes out because uh today's thursday right wow as i'm recording this it's thursday i'm realizing but i think he's going to be putting something out oh, like tomorrow friday whatever day is today, the 21st. So Friday, the 22nd, there'll probably be something on Howdy's channel about Moon Knight and about, uh, uh, what's his, Kansu, <laughs> the hidden aspect of Tehuti Thoth. And that's really brilliant. So because he was so inspired by this chat and I'm so inspired by this chat, I decided I'm going to move it up. And even though I had an interview in line ahead of this to be the next released episode, I think this is going to be the next released episode instead. It just fits. It feels right. Uh, probably going to see a future episode of The Marvelous Demystifiers. Myself, Gabriel, and Gordy go into talking about Moon Knight. Most likely we'll wait till that series wraps up. So not for the April conversation. I think we're going to do a Doctor Strange conversation first. But really amazing how much opportunity there is to break all this stuff down and talk about all this. One thing that I would have liked to discuss with Howdy that we didn't get into were more talk was maybe more talk about like the ethereal lines on the planet, ley lines as they're called, dragon lines. If he knows anything about how the idea that telegraph cables and lines actually follow that, and maybe that's part of how the technology worked. Don't know. Because I'm curious about Antiquitech, man. I'm curious about how communications, comms would maybe be applied through this etheric resonance technology, this antiquitech, this water-based technology. Watch the water. <laughs> and also was curious to ask him about the Cliff High's web bot, if he knows about that. We didn't get to it, but the web bot is this algorithmic program developed by a guy named Cliff High that scans the internet and people's use of language online in order to make predictive uh, ideas about what's coming in the future as if like when uh, something gets talked about enough or a word comes up enough then that is indicative of higher self of humanity becoming aware in a prescient way you know that 
something about that word or that concept is symbolically important or literally important in the near future. And I believe he actually using the web bot was already talking about something like a sun disease coming up. And then of course we get Corona, which represents the sun coronavirus. So who knows? And I'm thinking about all this, this web bot thing and our friend snake Jones, his online handle snake Jones 19 and how now there is all this stuff going on. Like watch the water with this Dr. Artist guy talking about how there is a snake venom in the cow pokes and snake venom in the water supplies and that this snake venom has a 19 compounds in it. 19 is the number of the sun card in tarot. So the sun disease, the serpent cult, the ophiolatry of it all. There's so much there. <laughs> Gosh. Uh, and you know what? I was also really impressed with how quickly, how quickly when Howdy and I were talking in the first hour that we got to this concept of multiverse and simulation, but from a spiritual level and an empowering level rather than like, a, I don't know, the way these things are often talked about. I love this idea that we reached that we can tap into versions of self that have already got the knowledge and the skill and the experience that we need in that particular moment and how dreams might be that might be you living other lives for whatever reason that you need some experience from that alternate life. Because I do think reality is one, right? There's only one reality. So multiverse as a concept is tricky for me. It's kind of like the word supernatural. You know, how can something super, supra meaning above or beyond, how can there be that which is beyond nature if nature is all of existence? And in much the same way, how can there be a multiverse in a universe? If there's a one song of a unified pleroma of all existence, how can there be more than one of that? But hell, I don't know. Maybe I'm just getting lost in words here. <laughs> it's very possible. At the end of the day, I feel that what is most empowering of a perspective and how we can remove the limiters on ourselves by reanalyzing and rethinking how we're using words. I believe that taking the limiters off is the best, op the best thing that we can do. And actually, as I said that I got like a ping, man, I felt like something hit me in the right ear, like a ding, ding, ding. You're right. <laughs> I felt this weird energy shift. So I think a guide was hitting me up and saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. Take the limiters off. Definitely. Thanks guide. Or is stuff in the right ear, the bad ear? <laughs> why has it got to be a good side and a bad side, right? Why, why indeed? Why demonize the feminine? Why demonize the yin, the left-hand path? I mean, not saying that people don't do wrong and under the name of the left-hand path, but you get what I'm saying. All of reality is important in the grand scales of balance. And so I guess at this point, it's probably time that I start making the way towards a wrapping up of this meandering outro. Really enjoy doing what I'm doing. And I appreciate that you are along for the ride. Thank you. Especially those of you who supported and are part of the Patreon or the Rockfin community. And yet you're still listening to me in this outro, even though you heard the whole conversation with Howdy, which is the real meat of the matter. Thanks for being here. And I'd love to work together or stay connected in a community sense. Please join our Telegram group. That is the best way to join the tribe. And man, it is a good tribe. There are so many geniuses, so many brilliant people that you can connect to through that group. And it's just always all day popping off with enlightening, insightful conversations, people asking the right questions and helping each other find new answers, which then lead to new questions. And it is a beautiful, expansive area of the living internet, as opposed to the dead internet of the Googles and the Facebooks and the YouTubes of the, the dead internet. So join us on Telegram. There's a lot going on there. We have so many side groups. Art is being shared. People are finding their own connections to community that they need, you know, through one of the things I love about this is I loved or what I wanted to do with my show was find a way to help myself transcend from doing work that I didn't feel aligned with, that I don't resonate with, that isn't my higher calling, my higher purpose, and be supported by universe and by you out there who are supporting me for doing what I'm here to do and what I love. And in the meantime, or at the same time, I wanted to translate that journey to everybody else and help everyone else 
in some way, either energetically or literally or in an advice manner, get that exact same path, get on that same path, find their way to do what they're here to do and not spend so much of their time, energy and life force just to exchange for the seeming need for numbers on a screen in terms of currency, right? Find a way to be supported by universe for doing what we love, which universe wants to do. Universe loves it when we have fun and whenever we feel enlivened by our path, because then it will put more of itself and more life force energy into the vessel that we are so that it can have more fun through us. I think that is completely true. So following the fun, following the hell yes in life is a, is a key component towards those unseen forces coming to your aid. And so all that being said, in our Telegram community, I'm really happy to witness others joining this community and bringing their goods in whatever form those, that goodness is to the community and finding support there. You know, that what has come up and built up organically around Interverse isn't just for me and for my benefit alone. It is ours. It's our thing. It's our community. I, I love that. And I'm witnessing it more and more. And I just am happy to see it. So happy to see it. Love everybody out there that's part of our community, even the silent watchers. But hey, if you are craving some authentic connection with human beings that are not drones, <laughs> Telegram group is definitely a good place to do it. Or hit our live chats on Wednesday nights when we do Vibrant episodes on Wednesdays at 8 p.m. Central. We do them on YouTube and Rockfin, and then they get uploaded. Replays get uploaded elsewhere later. But yo, it's so fresh live. Come join us live. So much fun. Uh, also, you can hit me up for sound healing, sound balancing, what have you, what you want to call it, my tuning fork work that I've been doing for quite a while now. And if you want to know more about it, there's a web page on my website under the sound healing tab, under the shop tab, where you can find out more about the process. But you can also just email me, chance at interversepodcast.com, and we can set up a session for you. Very powerful modality. Or Oracle cards, you know. I miss doing the Oracle card group readings that I was doing the Interversal Oracle videos, live streams, like often on Monday or Tuesday. But dang, I'm just, I got a lot going on and I'm trying to keep up with it all. And I, sometimes you got to remove some layers in order to finish other layers. And they'll, those videos will come back, but that's for now. It's just not a thing. And uh, time is limiting and limited. <laughs> We're limited by that construct, unfortunately, until I figure out a way to transcend it or clone myself. But I'm loving all the different things I'm involved in. Currently got multiple audiobook projects in the works. I mean, I can only do one at a time, but that's a big time consumer because if you don't keep at it, it doesn't move <laughs> and things pile up on you. So right now there is the one audiobook I've completed, Spirit World, July's End with Black Swans. Linked on my website, linked in the episode description at the bottom for every episode. Highly recommend tuning into that audiobook. If you haven't, definitely a lot of context with conversations like with Howdy Today in terms of syncretizing mythological information and etymological information. But yeah, okay, I've given you all the plugs for all the things. Chance at interversepodcast.com. Join our Telegram group. Hit me up for sound healing. That's all the stuff. Thanks for listening and watch out for Howdy's upcoming video where he's probably going to talk about some of the things inspired by this conversation, which I love. Oh, you know what the last thing I want to say is I am sure Howdy gets brought into a lot of podcasts and invited to a lot of podcasts. And at the beginning of this conversation, he was like, you know, sometimes by an hour and a half, my brain is kind of switched off and I don't have very thoughtful responses anymore. So I don't know about doing two hours. And I totally feel that. I totally feel that sometimes when I'm in a two hour or, you know, a long form interview and I'm being interviewed sometimes by that hour and a half point, I'm not feeling as inspired anymore. And the flow state kind of wanes. So I get it. I'm not offended by that at all. And I just let him know, Hey, just send me a little message in the interface here. If you want to start moving towards a wrap up sooner than two hours, but then we got to two hours and we were fired the heck up. We were so fired up still because the, the flow and the information transfer between us was just like rapid fire electricity. Love it. Love it. Howdy was great. So stoked on this conversation that I just talked an extra 20 minutes at, <laughs> for the outro. So I really got to finish this up, but I'm going to play us out with a track from 
the uh, outro credits to the Moon Knight TV show. I, kinda, I really like this. It's kind of like uh, trappy, classical, Eastern-y sounding electronic music. I don't know. Hopefully Disney doesn't ding me for using their tune. Probably going to be fine. But that's the music at the end here. Thanks for listening, everybody. Love you all. See you guys on the next one. And uh, be good out there. Much love. Bye-bye.